I'm sorry. Good morning and welcome to Elm Street Congregational Church. It's uh, October 4th, 2020, and this is our first service of the day. We are going to have a second service out front to the side of the church um, this, air, or this morning at 11 o'clock. So if you uh, want to, to come to an outdoor in-person service, it's at 11 o'clock. It will be very similar to this service. Um, We'll be doing communion in one kind. That means you need to bring a piece of bread or a cracker. We're not going to do the um, juice part. And you need to bring a chair or something to sit on. And the service should take about 30 to 40 minutes. So I want to welcome everyone here. It is a beautiful fall day. Welcome to David and Sue and Trish. My favorite romper room time of the day. And I have some announcements. So this week, we are uh, this next week, we're going to have worship on Zoom. Now, if you don't know how to do Zoom, call me or text me or message me, and I will uh, help you figure out how to set it up. Because you can do it on your computer, you can do it on your phone. Um, and we're going to try that next week, which means we will actually have hymns to sing, which will be nice. Um, and the backpack food program is starting up again. Uh, Trish said that they have a lot of uh, need right now with the stimulus package ending, with people not having work, that food shortage is a real problem. Now, I know that it's been hard for many of you to get into church to drop off things. And I have a solution, I think. What we need is a driving ministry. That is someone or, or several someones who would once a week uh, pick up things at people's houses that can't drive in here to drop them off. Um, so if you have a driver's license and you have some free time on your hands, we will work out how to set that up logistically and about um, how people would get in contact with you so that, that you would know where to go to pick things up. But I think that's something that we could really use right now, kind of like our own little Pony Express. All right, so pray uh, and see if may, that job, uh, that mission uh, might, might be your call. Your call might be to that mission. All right, so the First United Methodist Church, Pastor Sabina's Church, is doing a clothing um, where they give out clothing. I don't know if they're calling it a clothing bank. I don't know what they're calling it. But I do know that if you want to clean out your clothes in your closet and your shoes and whatever else you need or have, that uh, you should take it to the First United Methodist Church because they're providing those to our homeless population and are uh, working poor. It's free of charge. They don't pay anything for it. Um, they're also providing food. Uh, so if we might want to uh, check in with them to see how we might be able to help. Okay? Um, Tuesday night is leadership team meeting and Monday night is what is the Bible class and I I'm going to try to upload the Joshua class that's a Tuesday night class beforehand so that it's there uh, even though I will be at a meeting okay all right look at all these folks who have stopped in Hamer and Eric and Mike and Sue, sign me up. I don't know what for, Sue. Sign you up for the driving thing? Or the backpacks? You can tell me later. All right. Um, so, let's begin our service. So, this morning is communion service, so you should have your cracker and your drink. But I learned from Father Richard that if we don't have the elements, it's okay, because we can still have what's called spiritual communion. Um, and that for many people who uh, have to be in the presence of the bread and wine, that a spiritual community, a communion has been the only way they've been able to have communion. So it is a practice. Uh, and so I invite you, if you do not have bread or juice, that it's okay to participate spiritually. Okay. 
All right, so uh, I, I don't have a worship leader now, but I will have one at 11 o'clock. That's when our outdoor worship starts. And... Thank you, Mike. Um, good morning, Jeff. You should be here soon, right? Maybe? I don't know. All right. Okay, next week... Nope. Like I said, Marcy's going to be here at 11 to do the outside service, and this morning I'm doing all the parts by myself. So it occurred to me that all the parts that I asked her to write I don't have, so I had to write my own part. So there will be some parts of this service that are different than the service uh, at 11 o'clock. But uh, let us gather to come and seek God who restores, who restores uh, himself and with us, restores us with him and who then teaches us and asks us to restore our relationships with one another. And Holy God, our Father and our Mother, we thank you so much for the gifts that you have given us. And we ask you to come among us this morning to open our eyes and open our hearts and open our ears so that we might more fully understand your plan for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, um, we're going to do offertory now and at 11. And, uh, you know, stewardship is so very important. It's not, it's not just because we need money. But we do. Every organization on earth needs money. But we need... Um, we need to be stewards. We need to support the ministry. It's part of our calling as Christians. And, it, you know, some of us can support it a lot. Some of us not so much. And that's all right. But support what you can. Because the church's purpose is not for us. It's for the people that come after us. That we are the holders. We are the stewards of the church right now. And it's imperative that we that we count the church as important in our lives and one of the ways that we do this is by our monetary offerings so I'm going to give thanks for the things that have been given this morning and for the things that will be given later Holy God our Father and our Mother thank you so much for being our God for giving us your son Jesus Christ help us to keep in mind that we always need to give back to you and let these small gifts build your kingdom so that all might have enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning is in Matthew. Uh, we are working our way um, to Easter, even though we're going to break that and go to Christmas soon. But Jesus is, uh, he has passed into Jerusalem on Passion or Palm Sunday. And uh, he is now in uh, conversation with the rabbis. Remember last week they were asking him a question, then he asked them a question, and nobody wanted to answer any questions. And so we got the parable of the two sons, one that wanted to go, or one that said he would go and work in the vineyard, and one that said that he wouldn't go, and the one that said that he would didn't. And the one that said that he wouldn't did. Remember, that was last week. So this week we have the parables of the wicked tenants. So Jesus is talking to the same chief priests and elders. And he says, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenant to collect his produce. But the tenant seized his slaves and beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when uh, the tenant saw his son, they said to themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw them out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? 
And the elders said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. And Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone that this was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. As our scripture reading for this morning. So this morning's sermon then is based on that uh, parable of the tenants. And um, I actually wrote this one out. We'll see how that goes. All right. So last week we left Jesus in Jerusalem in conversation with the chief priest and the elders who had gotten caught up in a rabbinical argument answering questions with questions. This, remember the parable of the two sons? And that was meant to point out who was really serving the father, the one who said he would and didn't, and the one that said he wouldn't and did. We just talked about that. Uh, and this morning's parable is an allegory. So an, an allegory, uh, it's called the Wicked Tenants, and an allegory is a literary form that has hidden meaning. Um, and so we might ask, well, what is the hidden meaning in this allegory of the wicked tenants? All right, so this story is about retributive justice versus restorative justice. So that we know that when Jesus came to us, his, his coming to us was to restore the kingdom of God. It was to restore right relationship between humans and God. It wasn't coming to be, uh, for retribution he wasn't coming with the um the idea that he was going to make all of us pay right because the deal is if we all had to pay nobody would be able to pay their own debt we would all be lost eternally and the only way that we can be saved be part of god's kingdom is for restorative justice so if we look at this story like this the landlord sets up a fruitful vineyard then hands it over to the tenants and as stewards and then goes away. And when he tries to collect his portion, they kill his slaves and they kill his son. And it's terrible. So if we are to understand God as the landlord and humans as the stewards and the vineyard as earth, we might understand the hidden meaning in this parable so we can only speculate why the landlord leaves maybe he goes to start another vineyard somewhere else we, we don't know uh, but if we see God as the landlord we do want to ask well why does God leave and uh, again we speculate uh, when Adam and Eve were put in the garden they were like little babies and he had to provide them with everything and at some point they grew up enough to be disobedient right and he's like oh you're ready to be on your own, out you go, right? Now we call that original sin, but maybe that is the place that we have to start in order to grow as individuals. We can't make a right choice unless we know there's a wrong choice to make. So, um, so I think that God probably leaves us alone so that we can grow up and become adults, both as people and spiritually. Um, and it's harder to spiritually be an adult than it is to be a physical adult. Right. So the premise here is that God does not stick around and micromanage. Uh, because if he did, we, would we really grow? I mean, if your mother micromanages your whole life, do you ever actually get to make your own decisions? And the answer is no. That's why you, you grow up and you move away. 
All right, um, because we don't all we don't want to stay infants forever, you know. Even though if someone takes care of us, that sounds really good, but it it stuns us as people. We don't grow. All right, so uh, this is how I think that we are made in God's image. So God creates, makes things, makes decisions, uh, sets things up, puts them in order. And because we are made in God's image, we too grow into decision-making beings so that we can create, put things in order, and make decisions. And that helps to make us responsible. So you know it's not easy to be responsible. And you know sometimes when you have to make a decision, there's no like clearly right or clearly wrong decision. There are pros and cons about decisions across the board and that we as adults have to navigate that all the time. So um, we also don't want to count this as deism. So deism is what our most of our founding fathers believed in and they believed in God as the as the clockmaker or the watchmaker where he makes everything, he winds it up, sets it in place, and then he goes on vacation and he never comes back. And the reason why this isn't deism is because God does continue to show up. You know, uh, he sends his servants and more servants, and he finally sends his son. Um, that God is always sending someone to us to make real the love of, of, of God. Uh, he sent the prophets all through the Old Testament. He sent Jesus. He has sent saints uh, and prophets to us uh, all through the ages. And the message is the same. God loves you, and God requires you to love God and to love one another. That's the message. And love here, remember, is not that sticky, sweet um, baby powder smell that you get with the baby or little puppies or when you're falling in love with someone. That's not the kind of love. All right. This is the love that seeks justice for everyone, that wants people to care for one another, that wants everyone to have enough, that doesn't get um, pulled into self selfish and greedy plots, but who can maintain a, a level of self-control and mix it with tons of kindness and empathy and help other people to grow in empathy and kindness and make good decisions so that we all benefit. When we make good decisions, we all benefit. When we don't, not good. All right. Um, so we know what happens. So when the, the stewards, um, when someone comes to the stewards, so when someone comes to the people of earth, like the prophets, and they don't like them, well, just get rid of them, right? Done. And that's what happened to Jesus. He came to earth. He had this great message. Love God. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Um, practice forgiveness. Make sure everybody has enough. And what did humans do? We killed them. Because that's not a message we want to hear, right? We want more of a prosperity gospel. If you do what, if you, do what you think God wants you to do, then you will profit. And it's all about making more of something that not the so profit as in as in making more money or profit as in telling the truth, right? We want the making more money one. We're not so keen on telling the truth though. All right, so In today's parable, Jesus, in the same rabbinic fashion, he poses a question to the leaders of Israel, and he says to them, so now, what does the landlord, um, what will the landlord do when he comes uh, back to see these tenants? What will he do to them? And the leaders of Israel answer. So this tells them what they would do, right? Because when you answer somebody a question, on what would Jesus do, it usually then ends up, on, well, what would I do? So this is their answer. They said, we would put those wretches, or he will put those wretches to a miserable death and leave the vineyard to new tenants that will give uh, him the produce at harvest time. Hmm. That sounds like retributive justice, doesn't it? 
it's going to pay them back for the bad stuff they've done. Um, and then it goes on to talk about scripture, and he finally looks at them and says, you know, this story is about you, because you are not producing the fruits of the kingdom of God. It's going to be taken away from you and given to others who do produce the fruits of God. So, and this, we interpret this to mean us as Christians. Now, sometimes... Sometimes we get a little carried away with ourselves and we want to color the Jews in the story and say this is this is shows how bad the Jews were and it doesn't show how bad Jews were it shows how bad people are because if we looked at church history throughout the ages we would find plenty of scenarios where the church leaders or even secular leaders want things their way and they don't really care how just things are for everyone else. So if we look, if we look at this story and we see that God is the landlord and the tenants are humans and the earth is the vineyard. And we look at this and we say, hmm, how is this playing out today? All right, so uh, don't get caught up in, as this is a negative Jewish trope or an anti-Semitic proof of, of biblical leanings because the Bible in the New Testament is not anti-Semitic because most of the people in it are Jews. And what it's saying is that any group of people anywhere can um, be selfish and greedy and not pay attention to what God wants them to do. So if we situate this story in our time, We mostly participate in retributive justice, right? Retribution. We don't really go for restorative justice. So restorative justice is what God did with us through Christ. Uh, Christ, uh, one way to look at it is Christ is the atonement that is paid on our behalf so that we might be washed clean or acceptable to God so that we won't carry all of our garbage along with us um, so that that God's love for us which was manifested in Christ would flourish okay and um, practicing restorative justice takes a long time it's not a quick thing. It's not 30 days in the slammer or 20 years in the slammer or it's not like that. It's not life imprisonment and it's not the death penalty. Restorative justice takes time because it causes you to have to figure out why things are broken and how do you restore them and that restorative justice requires not just action, uh, contrition, atonement. It requires that you figure out where you went wrong and that you make amends to the best of your ability and that the people with whom you have sinned against also have to have the proper attitude for restorative justice to work. It's a hard, long process and we're looking at that in many ways right now in our own country and the world is how do we practice restorative justice that builds community, that builds relationships and that doesn't just punish you, your bag goes stand in the corner, right? So we have this pull between retributive and restorative justice. So um, retributive justice is the one we're used to. It's the one the world uh, likes to use. Restorative justice is harder, but it is the right way to go. And we have to be uh, reflective and think about our own greed and our own selfishness and our own desire for vengeance. Now, I know that this is going to sound crazy, but sometimes I want retributive justice too. And sometimes, even as a pastor, I want vengeance. Especially when I see something that is really horrible going on and then I want something bad to happen to the people who are causing the pain. Now that is not a Christ-like attitude. That is not something Jesus promoted. 
And I can't even get back and say it was a righteous anger because I don't have enough righteousness to, in order to be angry. But I have to be thoughtful and considerate, in which I'm not always, but I do, I try to do that. Sometimes I confess that I should do that, but I don't want to yet, right? So because we have to deal with our anger and our emotions. But our world today is broken. You know that. We are being almost required to hate people who are not like us. Every time you turn on the television, every time you turn around, you hear somebody somewhere spewing hate. And it, it is the weight of hate is weighing us down. Because we have got to break through that hate that seeks retributive justice for things that may or may not even be real. And we need to work with one another to restore not just the church, right, which is broken right now too. There are churches that are antithetical to one another. There are churches who think that other churches aren't Christian because they don't believe exactly the same things they believe. I mean, we're really divided. And at some point, we're going to have to seek restoration. It's going to cause many of us to have to be really humble. And, and to really show the love of Christ in our actions and our words. There's a lot of work ahead of us. And... Um, it's economic work, it's social justice work, um, it, is, it is the work of restoration, of putting things back together. We can only do that with the help of God. We can only do that through the love of Christ. We don't have enough on our own to actually get that done. Because we are all skewed with self-interest. We're always skewed with selfishness. And we're always skewed with greed. Even if it's just a little bit, it's still there. So we have to come to terms with the fact and know that we live off the back of those who make very little money. Always have in our society. Our wealth comes from underpaying and undervaluing workers. And, um, and making, uh, and, and we often, to make ourselves feel better, we um, demonize. Homeless, the broken, the sick, the forgotten, the undereducated. We devalue and use people who speak different languages, that have different skin tones, and that practice different religions. And this list could go on and on and on. We live in a secular world that wants us to blame, retaliate, seek retribution on all of these categories of people. Because we are afraid that they will take something from us. We never count what we have taken from them. God does not want this. God wants love. Love restores all types of relationship. And it involves acknowledgement of wrongdoing. It involves atonement, contrition, and turning away from the sin that caused the problem in the first place and turning your eyes and your hearts toward restoration. So we need to think and live in terms of restorative justice, not retributive. We need to learn to see the world from many different points of view. We need to be reflective about who we are, who we blame, about how vengeful we really are on our own, we have to look at our brokenness and the brokenness of the world, and we have to know in our hearts that restorative justice is the way. So, we are going to have communion this morning. So if you have your cracker, that's great. And if you don't, that's fine, because you can take spiritual communion and your drink. Holy God, our loving creator, close to us as breathing and distance as the father star, we thank you for your constant love, 
for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life, for all people in every faith and every generation who have given themselves to your will, and especially for Jesus Christ, whom you have sent from your own being as our Savior. We praise you for Christ's birth, life, and death, and resurrection, and for the calling forth of your church for its mission and one mission in the world. Gifted by the presence of the Holy Spirit, we offer ourselves to you as we reunite our voices with the entire family of faithful people everywhere. So merciful God, as sisters and brothers in faith, we recall anew the words and acts of Jesus Christ. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and after having given thanks, he gave it and poured it out. Um, he said, this is the covenant of my, and my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. We remember Christ's promises to not drink of the vine again until a heavenly blanket banquet and at the close of history. And we say boldly what we believe. So come, Holy Spirit, come and bless this bread and bless this fruit of the vine. Bless all of us in our eating and drinking at the table that our eyes may be opened and that we may recognize the risen Christ in our midst and each other and all for whom Christ died. So now, take your bread. This is my body. And he said to eat of it and let us do this. And the blood of Christ, of the new covenant, he said, when you do this, drink this in remembrance of me. So let us do that. Let us give thanks for the communion at this, at this beautiful table. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ, strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in the uh, courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. So to do prayers of the people, and we are running late, and the... Um, but we're going to do the prayers of the people. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, would you please write that in? I'm looking. Good morning, Patricia. How are you doing? How's your mother? Jasmine, I hear you. I both worked and went to class, too. Thank you, Miriam. <clears throat> and love does build bridges. And that's the whole point of restorative justice. All right. And Gay says her brother is in rehab, pneumonia, and gallstones. This is terrible. And his wife is having a hard time walking. Doug Mutton. And if I have missed anybody, I apologize. Um, all right. I'm seeing some of you coming for the service by my window, so I guess I'm a little bit distracted. So, holy God, we have joys and concerns this morning. We uh, pray for Gay Roberts' brother and his wife and their health concerns. We also want to pray for Dave Corkum's co-worker who died of cancer this past week and he is attending the service right this morning on um, uh, video. 
And we want to pray for Joan and Alan's family and their granddaughter Shelby. And uh, for Doug Mutton. And D. LaCroix, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that last name properly, um, whose son is Doug and who attended here many years ago and then when they moved, they attended a federated church in Sturbridge, has died um, Thursday morning. Uh, we got the word through John Shaw, so if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure he'd be able to help you out with that. Um, she had lung cancer. And she fought a good fight. But many times cancer does not let us win. So let's keep Doug in our prayers. And because maybe that he's okay. All right. So let us keep these in our prayers. And holy God, we uh offer our prayers for these folks that you will be with them that you will be their Emmanuel and that you will help them through these uh, difficult stages and acts of life we pray for our church and the leadership of our church we pray for the congregation that you might keep us all on the straight and narrow path that you might help us to learn who we are and how our mission our personal mission in the world can work together so that we might bring your kingdom here and grow and cultivate those good fruits of the kingdom. We pray for all those who have COVID-19, for their families. We pray for all those who have died from this horrible disease. We pray for all those who have been exposed. And we pray for all of the first and front, first responders, frontline workers, who are out there making everything safe for us and who in doing so put their very lives in danger. We pray for all the churches in our community. We pray for all of our brothers and sisters who are Christians that we all might together seek restorative justice. We thank you for all that you have given us, O oh Lord, and for all that you have taken away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning I will leave you with this. Let God's peace be upon you. Let God call you forth into mission. And may you find joy in your work in the vineyard. Blessings and peace be upon you. Amen.